If we follow a single breath that comes out of my nose, very quickly that one breath spreads by convection through this room, and every one of us is breathing gazillions of argon atoms from that one breath. But of course the door is open, that breath eventually diffuses across Vancouver, across Canada, around the world, and according to Shapley, one year later, wherever you are in the world, because air is a single matrix, every breath you take will have about 15 argon atoms that came from that one original breath a year before. So on that basis, Shapley calculates that every breath you take has argon atoms that were once in the bodies of Joan of Arc and Jesus Christ. That every breath you take has argon atoms that were in the bodies of dinosaurs 65 million years ago. That every breath you take will suffuse terrestrial life forms as far as we can see into the future. I've had a girl once say to me that it's so funny that I think the world is a girl. That sentence stuck with me for a long time. It showed me the power of perception, how one's belief system is shaped by experiences and information. On one hand, you have people who view the Earth as a biosphere, and on the other hand, you have people who view the Earth as it is, a superorganism. What most people fail to see is that they are a microscopic organism on top of a macro-organism. The size of the Earth compared to a human is relative to a bacteria cell compared to the size of your body. And the relationship between us and the Earth is quite similar to the relationship between foreign beneficial bacteria and your body. Keep that in mind when I say that we are all connected to the Earth. We've all heard of DNA, the code coiled up in each cell of your body the code that determines what kind of organism you'll become, the code that's carried down by the egg and the sperm. Have you ever wondered how that's even possible for you to form from a single-celled organism to a full human body onwards to an adult within a short amount of time? The process of cellular mitosis is the ongoing process of evolution. Each generation is a result of the iteration, and it continues to change over millions and millions of years. And in our planet's case, it's been said that life has been present on this planet for roughly one and a half billion years. This is to give you an idea of how evolution is not some event that happened, more so than it is a day-by-day -day adaptation. Our species' DNA is a branch of DNA, one of the many millions of different species that make up the family tree, the Earth family tree. Every living thing is related. I've covered this in Awakening of Gaia, but I will state it once again. The Earth is indeed a living organism, a sentient organism. There is a network called mycelium that runs through the soil and connects to the roots of every plant and tree. The mycelium infuses all landscapes, it holds soils together, it's extremely tenacious, it holds up to 30,000 times its mass. We have now discovered that there is a multi-directional transfer of nutrients between plants mitigated by the mycelium. So the mycelium is the mother that is giving nutrients from alder and birch trees to hemlock cedars and Douglas firs. This is photomicrographs from Nick Reed and Patrick Hickey. And notice that as the mycelium grows, it conquers territory and then it begins to net. I've been a scanning electron microscopist for many years. I have thousands of electron micrographs. And when I was staring at the mycelium, I realized that there are microfiltration membranes. We exhale carbon dioxide, so does mycelium. It inhales oxygen, just like we do. But these are essentially externalized stomachs and lungs. And I present to you the concept that these are extended neurological membranes. There's alternative pathways for channeling nutrients and information. The mycelium is sentient. It knows that you are there. When you walk across landscapes, it leaps up in the aftermath of your footsteps trying to grab debris. What we think we know is that there is some kind of electrochemical communication between the roots of the trees, like the synapses between neurons. And each tree has 10 to the fourth connections to the trees around it. And there are 10 to the 12th trees on Pandora. Which is a lot, I'm guessing. It's more connections in the human brain. Get it? It's a network. 
Mycelium is the only reason why life on land was possible. Studies show that when distributing mycelium spores on radioactive waste, that mycelium literally fed on the toxic material, converting it into a baseline for soil to form. Nutritional properties are given and, and plant life is allowed to form. This leads me to believe that the common ancestor of plants, algae, was allowed to evolve on land due to the conditions made possible by mycelium. And don't forget, mycelium is a fungus. This emphasis will come into play in later episodes. For now, I just want to emphasize on the point that our separation from the earth has led to our separation from life, leading the world to its self-destruction. Due to our culture's mechanistic point of view, we disassociate ourselves from the earth and classify it as the environment. This makes way for a society that sees itself as separate from the rest of life. This is all a fallacy. So I realized we had defined the problem incorrectly. There's no environment out there and we are here and we somehow have to watch the way we interact with it. We are the environment. The truth of the matter is we are a part of something great and we must realize what our role is in all this. We're allowing this earth to be eliminated due to not giving a fuck. This mentality facilitated by laziness spawns the rot that sickens the human race the killer of what it is to be human. See, this is what people must understand. Whatever we do to our surroundings, we do directly to ourselves. The environmental crisis is a human crisis. We are at the center of it, both causing the problems and as the victims of the consequences. 